I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles this morning. Turn over to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking there briefly this morning. And then we're going to make our way over to the book of Revelation. Where we will spend pretty much the remainder of our morning. Before we read there in Matthew, I want to take this opportunity to welcome each and everyone here with us this morning. We're excited that we're able to come together and we're excited that we're able to open up God's word and study it and emphasis on studying it. Because sometimes what we as human beings have a tendency to do is we want an answer, right? We have a question, we want an answer, and we want it as quickly as possible. What do we do when we are scrolling through, let's say, an Adobe document on our computer and we're trying to find an answer? I know for me, I hit control F. And I go and there's that little find bar. And so I put in a, a key word on what I'm looking for. So let's use a, an example. Let's say I am doing this with science. And let's say I'm trying to find out what is photosynthesis. So I'll put in control F and I'll type in photosynthesis. And I'll look and I'll see what it is. Well, if you were to do that, you'd probably find out photosynthesis is a biological process where it takes light, converts it into energy. And it's a true statement. But is that the whole picture? Is that everything that is involved in photos photosynthesis? photosynthesis? I'm not going to say that word anymore. No, it's not. Because it doesn't talk about how that energy is stored in other cells. It doesn't talk about what happens to that energy. It just gives you part of the picture. There's a question that was put in the question box in the back. And yes, that is a little, little drop to remind everybody. We do have a question box in the back. So if you have questions, please put them in there. But there was a question that was put in there asking about the seven seals. The seven seals that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, which really there's a lot more than just the seven seals. This morning, we're not going to answer that question yet. But what we are going to do is instead of trying to control F, we're going to look at that vision. What does John see? What did that mean for them? What does that mean for us? And we're going to lay a foundation for us to be able to answer that question. And not answer it in necessarily the simplest of ways. But in the fullest way that we can. So that we can understand. And not just try to be able to say something quick. See, when we look in, in places like Revelation... And the reason it's so important for us to study and study it to its fullest is it's largely symbolic. There's lots of symbolism, lots of things going on in this vision of John's that some of it we're not going to look at. Some of it we are. But if we try to just find that simple answer, we lose meaning. I want to use Matthew as an example of that a little bit this morning. Before we get in to show how important it is that we don't do that, in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 5 through 15, it says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the corners of the streets, and that they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray with your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father who knows the things you, ha you have the need of before you ask Him, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You might be thinking, Jason, what does that have to do with symbolism? But if we were to search and say, how do we pray? And we pull up the prayer that Jesus uses as an example. What might we do? We might say that this is exactly the words that we are to say. What would most likely happen is we would not see the full picture. The picture of Jesus telling them, do not pray in vain with vain repetition. Do not pray to be seen by men. Have the right focus. Have the right mindset. Have the right understanding. That's what we're searching for this morning when we look in the book of Revelation. So I want us to begin by reading in Revelation chapter 4. And we're not going to read all of it. We'll read most of it. Because it's really not that long of a chapter to begin with. But in Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying evil eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. As we look at this vision, we need to start with its beginning. And we need to see who is this vision from. Who is it who is speaking to John? And as we see here, this message is very clearly from God. It is very clearly from the one who is above as we see the emphasis being put there. But why do they need this vision? Why is this vision so important? Why should we not overlook it? You see... The Christians at this time, they were dealing with heavy persecutions. They were dealing with trials. They were dealing with discouragement from the Roman Empire, from those around. And so what they need is comfort. What they need is courage. And as we're about to look throughout this vision that is what they get. They're rewarded with courage, with comfort, with knowledge. And it starts off by showing the beautiful throne room. This isn't just a throne room like we would think of in some of the movies that we might have seen. It's not just a throne, throne room that has marble, even though marble is, is truly beautiful. It's a throne room with the one sitting on the throne like Jasper and Sardis. These stones, go and look them up. They don't necessarily start off looking beautiful, but they truly are. 
They have different colorings. They shine almost to a glassy finish. And they're strong. That is the one who is sitting on the throne. Both beautiful and strong. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on and talks about the rainbow that is around the throne. You ever walking outside and see a rainbow and not say to yourself, wow? You ever stop and see a rainbow and not say to those who are around you, hey, look, a rainbow? We do that. Why? Because of how beautiful they truly are. Because of how wonderful and because of what they represent. There is a rainbow around the throne, and yet it still doesn't stop there. And it talks about the 24 elders. We're not going to get into the symbology of that. But we are going to talk about what they were wearing. The white robes. What does it mean when we talk about the white robes? It means pure. It means cleansed. These are those who are cleansed of their sins, cleansed of all of those things. And then it goes on and it talks about the sea of glass like crystal. There's so much beauty in this room alone. And if we stop for a minute and think about it, it provides us with encouragement. It alone provides us with peace, with understanding, because of what is there. We know this room, it isn't just that it's a beautiful room. Look in the following verses, in verses 9 through 11. Let's begin reading verse 9. It says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their cr crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they exist and were created. It is not just that it's a beautiful room. It's not just that it's a room that we can't begin to understand its beauty and how beautiful it truly is. The attitude of this room is beautiful. The humility that the elders have before the one who sits on the throne. The praise and honor that is brought continually. You notice it tells us there that they don't stop saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This should bring encouragement. Because the one who is saying what's going to happen, the one who is saying here is the reason you have comfort, it is not just some lowly being. It is the Almighty, the powerful. But then we move on in the vision. And we move on, and not to the sense that we leave the throne room, but that the focus shifts. And it shifts off of that onto the scroll. Let's begin reading here a little bit in chapter 5. It says in verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, 
And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven spirits, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The focus shifts to this scroll. But this scroll is not an ordinary scroll. It is held by God. By the one who is sitting on the throne, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that it is God who is sitting on the throne, and it is Christ who is sitting at the right hand of God. But what's the significance? We're going to talk about these seven seals, but we're going to talk about their significance right now for just a moment. These seven seals represent something. The number seven always represents fullness. It always represents completeness. And it does the same here. This scroll truly is the will of God. And we're about to see here next week and maybe the week after. We're about to see what that fullness is. It is such a marvelous thing and a wonderful thing to have this scroll. And we need to be able to see that. To see that wanting to know and, and having these questions, it's not a bad thing. It's not something that we should think and be ashamed that I'm wondering about what do these seven scrolls mean or seven seals mean. Because John even when he saw, he saw and he thought, though he was wrong, that there was nobody to open the scroll, he wept. If we saw how important it is, we would weep too if nobody could open it. But what is, what is John told? What is he shown? Well, that there is. That there is somebody who is worthy to open the scroll. And who was it? In verses 5 through 7, it uses words like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Words like the root of David. Words like a lamb, as though it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Sent out into all the earth. Who is the one who is able to open the scroll? Christ. Christ alone. Let's go back for a second and think about what these Christians are going through. Their persecutions and their trials. The reminder that they have from this vision. It's not just about what's to come, though we do see that. It is also about, here is your courage. Here is the one who was sent for you. Here is the one who is worthy to open this. And don't forget him. Don't forget what he did for you. Don't forget where he came from. Don't forget his power and his might and his love. There are, even though we can look at this and say that it's one vision, there are many parts to it. And if you continue reading in chapter 5, you see that it is filled in the second half with praise to the Lamb. Another way in which brings us comfort. Giving praise and remembrance of who He is. But are those Christians, the first century Christians, are they the only ones who need to be comforted? Or do we need to be comforted? Do we need to find comfort in our day to day? Absolutely. Just as God's people always have. Look into the Old Testament and you'll see that Israel 
the Israelites needed encouragement a lot. They needed comfort a lot. And they needed rebuke a lot too. But what does God do? He gives them comfort. He uses His providential hand to protect them and to take care of them. Look at the first century church. They dealt with persecutions that we don't deal with. And we're very blessed that we don't have to handle the same types of things they do or they did. But that doesn't mean that we aren't. It doesn't mean that we're not persecuted just because we might not be dragged out into a city square and beheaded. Because we are. Look at what happens when we stand up against the, the powers that speak evil. We can be silenced. We can be shut down. We can be told that, that we're trying to incite violence. And we've seen it. Do you think that that's not persecution? Trying to shut up Christians? Trying to shut down the truth? It is. You know, we don't only face that. We face trials just like the first century did. We face these times of, of hardships when we need to be able to lean upon each other. And we face temptation. And it seems like every time that we turn our head, there is more temptation. And so, do we need that courage? Do we need to be able to read places like Revelation and find it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But do we sometimes stray away from them as well because they're harder to understand? Yeah, we do, don't we? I have. Sometimes we don't look there as well. It's not controlled F. It's not just that simple, quick answer. But brethren, when we take the time to find the depth, we're not just... We're not just going to go another day and say, I'm good for another day. We're going to let that soak in. We're going to let that build us up and make us stronger. Because we can be reminded of the one who sits on the throne. We can be reminded that we have a Savior who is worthy to open the scroll. Who is worthy to reveal the will of God and who has. Next week, we're going to take some time to start looking at these seals and try to answer them. But we're going to do so remembering what the Christians are going through. Remembering what John has already seen. But as we conclude, I want to conclude with a thought of comfort. I feel like that's what this morning's really been about. The comfort that we have. But we should be comforted. Knowing that we don't have to live a life of not knowing. We talked in class about how hard it is to not know when something's going to happen. Or what's going to happen. But we don't have to do that. Because we get to know. We get to know what the day of judgment will bring. To those who follow in the steps of Christ, the peace and the eternal life. And to those who choose to do their own will, the torment and the eternal judgment. We get to know that we don't have to live this life alone. No, we're not alone. Not only do we have each other, which is a wonderful blessing and a wonderful plan that God has given us, but we have God. We have Christ. And we can turn to them always. 
what a wonderful thing to know that we have the creator of everything. But there's one thing that in order to have this type of comfort, we have to do. That's be baptized. In order for us to have the forgiveness of sin, the, the remission of sin, we have to be part of Christ. Have His blood wash away those sins. And the only way that's possible is through baptism. That's it. And so this morning, if you're not in Christ, if you haven't yet been baptized, or maybe you have, brethren, we can fall as well. And if we have fallen out and we need to make things right in a public manner, repentance and confession in a public manner, or if we need prayers from our brethren, from those who are here we truly love each other. We want to show that. Let our actions speak for us and it not just be words. And so this morning, if you need to be baptized, make public repentance or ask for prayers, we ask it and it's more than just asking. It's pleading with you. Come forward. Make things right. Make things known as we stand and as we sing.